Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word to us. It's a light for our path. It is food for our soul. May it be so for us this morning. Amen and amen. Uh, well, over the last few weeks, we've been listening to the words of Jesus in Matthew's gospel as he describes the kingdom of God uh, to his friends and to us. And as we've done this, what we've been doing in some ways is journeying along uh, with his disciples. So I wonder if for a moment, if you can imagine uh, with me for a moment what it might have been like uh, to be in the shoes of one of Jesus' friends. Imagine being Peter or Mary Magdalene uh, or any of those who are with him. Every day you're walking beside Jesus, beside the Sea of Galilee, you're watching how he interacts with people, you're hearing what he says, you're seeing the miracles and you're wondering what your part in it is. Is. Uh, as I think about the disciples, I think about eager, younger people, uh, by and large, who have given everything to follow Jesus. Uh, Jesus had called them, come, follow me, and they had taken that as a leap of faith and had done just that. Uh, but I can imagine that they had done this, they had followed Jesus without fully comprehending of what they were doing or what Jesus' project was. I don't think Jesus sat down with them with a flip chart and laid out the project plan for the kingdom of God and then held a recruitment interview to see who was on board. Uh, no, what they did was they encountered Jesus, just like many of us have done, something welled up within them, a yearning, a desire, a simple trust, and they wanted him. They, were, they, well, they followed him saying, shape my life, Jesus, teach me. See, the perspective of the disciples as they follow Jesus is an all of life learning. They see what he did. They see how he responds. They ask questions. Jesus teaches them not with diagrams, but with parables. And, and they learn to live out what it means to have God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The, king, the kingdom of God had come near to them, as Jesus himself said, and the gates of hell were not prevailing. And by the time we get to our reading here and the, and the passage that we have, they've had months, perhaps even years, of living and walking and speaking with Jesus and even after this whole time, I'm still not sure they could have got out the flip chart and described the kingdom of God business plan. They were still moved by Jesus. He was still their life. And I, but I wonder if people like Peter thought that this is how it would be forever, that the kingdom of God would be about them walking and talking around the Sea of Galilee. I wonder if we can imagine the disciples in that place. But there's a reflection for, here, for us here as well. What has been our experience of the kingdom of God? I'm not sure we could draw out the diagram on a flip chart either. But what has moved us to follow Jesus? What moves us now? How do we imagine what God's kingdom come on our earth in our time, in our city, in our lives, in our homes, and in our church. What does that look like? I asked a question like this on our WhatsApp group uh, just a few days ago, and, uh, and, and Ben sent in some of his thoughts, and I want to play those for you now, because uh, I, I think they're very useful. Hi, Will. Just been um, reading the passage and thinking about your question um, as to what it looks like for God's kingdom to come in our current context. Um, just thinking a bit about Peter, um, the kind of received wisdom is that Peter was a, a little bit of a failure. Lots of examples of him messing up, um, and this passage is a is a big example um, when. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. It's kind of uh, quite, a, quite a big th rebuke of Peter and, and his way of thinking. Um, but for me, like looking at the rest of Peter's life, um, he, you know, he gave up his job and spent several years living with Jesus, talking to Jesus, trying to understand what Jesus was saying. Um, so, 
even though he made some mistakes, he's actually kind of a bit of an inspiration in lots of ways. And so I feel like if he didn't know what it looked like for God's kingdom to come, if he didn't truly understand that, then, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know <laughs> where I stand. Um, I've listened to enough uh, sermons to kind of know the kind of basic context of, of what of Peter's expectations. They, um, the Jews at the time were obviously very focused on the fact that they were under Roman rule and they, they were, they believed that the Messiah was going to change that, they, that the Messiah was going to come and uh, rescue them from that um, political um, situation that they were, that was, must have been really big front and center of their minds at the time. Um, so when Jesus says, you know, I'm going to going to die, these bad things are going to happen to me, it's kind of not surprising that Peter um, couldn't compute that. And he was like, no way, that just doesn't, that just doesn't fit in with what I, what my idea of God's kingdom coming looks like. So I was kind of just, I guess, transposing that onto our own expectations as 21st century Christians. I think the question of what, what God's kingdom looks like can seem fairly obvious you know there's loads of bad stuff happening um like uh, you know, racial inequality um the state of the environment um global warming plastics in the oceans um there's loads of dictators around like putin and the belarusian guy and even president trump and we kind of think as christians like god's kingdom looks like these situations getting resolved um and closer to home as well, you know, we look at the food banks, we look at the um, the issues with exams and all that's happening here. And we think, well, if only we had a different government or if only Jesus would somehow come and sort it, that's what God's kingdom would look like. Um, so it just kind of made me think, really, you know, where do we, when we're thinking about what God's kingdom looks like, where do we get our information? Um, Peter was obviously getting it from the the kind of I guess they didn't have newspapers but whoever the popular opinion of the time was about the Romans and that they needed to get rid of them but Peter did have um information available to him um the scriptures that they they had showed what would happen to the Messiah if they looked closely enough um so I think my my answer really is let's not look at the newspapers to decide what God's kingdom looks like. Um, let's firstly look at the Bible, um, but really try and talk to each other and help each other understand and help each other focus on the things of God and not the things of man. Thanks, Ben. Um, they're really useful thoughts. Uh, the way I've reflected on it is to pick up on that a little and to see in, in Peter that there's something of a tension uh, on the one hand, uh, he knows what the kingdom of God is like because he's seen it. This is what life is about. Uh, he longs for the world to look more like what Jesus is doing. Uh, this moves him. So he, he understands it. But on the other hand, he doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't comprehend it. His conception of what God's plan is is limited, restricted, and even warped. Uh, and, and that's good because the kingdom of God isn't Peter-sized or Peter shaped. It's Jesus sized and Jesus shaped. And we get to see an insight into that tension as Jesus draws back the curtain uh, to reveal what lies ahead on the path to the kingdom of God. And we see that in our passage. From that time on, it says, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And on the third day, be raised to life. At this point, the, the tension in Peter is too much. Uh, Jesus saying he's going to die uh, is, is, doesn't compute. It doesn't fit his expectation. And so it says Peter took Jesus aside. It literally took him away from the others to correct him and, uh, and to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus responds quite forcefully. He turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. That it's, it's a very forceful uh, uh, rebuke. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely 
human concerns. Now, there's a, ten, there's a lesson here for Peter about who and what he has committed his life to. And there's a lesson here for us too. Jesus has revealed the path to the kingdom of God and we can learn from it. Whatever we might think the kingdom of God is, it is centred and grounded on Jesus and on his death and his resurrection. For the life of God's kingdom to be real, Jesus teaches Peter and teaches us, he must die, he must suffer, he must pass through death. It's the, the essence of what Jesus is saying. And we can wrestle with that as much as Peter does. And as we wrestle with that, the implications, I think, are quite clear and they're certainly important. Firstly, Jesus putting this, front in, putting this in front of us, that the kingdom of God comes through his death and resurrection, reveals to us the negative side of life. It reveals to us what we're up against, if you like. Ben mentioned in his thoughts uh, about how we can begin to grasp those negative things, things like uh, dictators and tyrants and all the problems. But those things are the symptoms. They aren't the problem. You see, if the problem of this world at its heart was something like a lack of education, or if the problem of this world at its heart were things like structural injustice or denial of our own innate goodness, then the kingdom of God would be addressing these things at its core. And Jesus would be saying, I must teach, I must be politically active, I must awaken people to the life that's already inside of them. But he didn't say that. He said, I must die and on the third day be raised to life. If, it, if the problems of this world were just about tyrants and dictators, then we could bring the kingdom of God by revolution. But then, of course, we would find that we have become the tyrants and we would be the problem. If the answer to the, the things we're up against was to go around and to talk about peace and love, then the kingdom of God would have come in the 60s because that what was happening all the time. Rather, we're up against something deeper, the, the deep and core things of human existence. And that is where Jesus is bringing the kingdom of God. He is bringing it to overcome human sinfulness, human rebellion against the ways of God, that deep core hardness of heart that rejects our creator and turns our backs on the author of life. The world isn't in need fundamentally of re-education or awakening. It's in need of redemption, of resurrection, of being taken from death back into life. And so the king of the kingdom must pass through death and come to life. That is where the kingdom of God is going. And we learn this at Easter. The new life of Jesus isn't a resuscitation back to some sort of second chance at breathing again. It's entering into a new category of existence. It's about being a new creation as his children and together being a new humanity filled with the spirit of Jesus. The kingdom of God is not just some second chance at the old it's about being brought into the reality of the new. Jesus is telling them how it really is and what it's going to take. And so his friends have been given a glimpse. They have been with him around the, kingdom, around the Sea of Galilee. And as they've walked with him and heard him, the kingdom of God has drawn near to them. But it comes in its fullness as Jesus leads them towards the cross and beyond. This is what he's trying to tell them. This is why Peter saying, no, Jesus, it's not going to be like that, is actually a stumbling block, almost a temptation for Jesus to stay where it's easy at the Sea of Galilee. But Jesus is forceful. He says, no, this is what we need to do. And soon Jesus will be telling Peter that he must leave them and send his spirit so that the kingdom of God may inhabit the disciples and spread to the ends of the world. And... and that's beyond what Peter can even ask or imagine at this time. But it's still the same call. It's still the same call that Peter heard on the shore near the fishing boats of come follow me. 
But now Peter is showing him where that call takes them. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. And that brings it back to us. We still have the same call. And it's worth us remembering. It's worth us asking ourselves these questions. What first drew you to Jesus? When did you hear the voice of Jesus say, come and follow me? What first moved you to be a part of God's people? What first stirred in you to see God's kingdom come? How do you imagine the way of Christ looks like for yourself, your home, our church, for Sheffield, for our neighbours? What has been your experience of God's call? Whatever comes from here on out for us, for our church, it's going to line up with that because it's still the same call. This year is an opportunity for a sort of resurrection, a rebuilding, a re-evaluation of who we are. But it's not some lofty strategy. We're not going to get out the flip charts and lay it all out. We're going to listen to the voice of the shepherd. So remember what his voice sounds like. Each of us have heard it before. Remember your oldest and truest prayers for yourself and your family and for the world around you. And as you reflect on these things, I'd love to hear what you have thought about and what your story is and how you've heard Christ call you in the past. But that call also takes us forward. He is going to take us beyond our comprehension. If the kingdom of God is limited to the good ideas that we can have and the wisdom that we can muster, then it's likely that we will simply be thinking about the things of human concerns rather than the things of God. Moving forward is going to be a spiritual task for us, seeking the way of Christ in and amongst ourselves first. We will need to lay down our idols, pick up our cross, lay down our lives and ambitions even, and do what Jesus did, entrust ourselves to God our Father who leads us by his Spirit. I wonder how Peter responded to that rebuke from Jesus. I'm assuming he was taken aback. I'm assuming he even felt hurt, perhaps a little bit wounded. But I also think he responded with faith. I think he heard Jesus. And I think in the end he responded with, Lord, okay, I trust you. I don't understand, but teach me. Deal with me. Help me to see. Where I need to change my mind and repent, exhort me. When I'm lacking, fill me, Lord. I give you my life again. Again, I will still follow you. In other words, he laid down his life. He picked up his cross and he offered himself to Jesus afresh. This then is our prayer for this moment. Lord, take us on your path. Inspire us as your people in this crucial time of upheaval and disruption to bring your kingdom to the depths of this world with the depths of your glory. Lord, we are your people. We have your way in us. Lord, we are yours. Your kingdom come here in our midst as it is in heaven. Amen and amen.